So basically, today's webinar is trying to address the question of where do you get started if you want to teach coding for children? So I'm assuming that here in this webinar, those who are going to be listening in or watching or joining us later, we have three categories of people. Parents who, are, who have kids, who are curious, want to learn how to code, and you're wondering, how do I help this child learn how to code? Or you have teachers who are in the school system. You probably teach kids coding, or you teach already, but you don't teach coding. And you're wondering, how do I help my students to learn to code? Or you're a school owner, educator, and you're wondering, yes, people have told me about coding a lot, and I'm trying to integrate this into the curriculum. Where do I get started, and how do I get started? Okay, so, so if you're in any of these categories I explained earlier, whether you are a parent, you are a teacher, you are a school owner, this webinar is designed just for you. And so as we get started, I'm just going to back up a little bit and start from the background. Now, we are all in Africa. Everybody joining this webinar is in a country somewhere in Africa. I will be surprised if we have anybody here who is not on the continent. But yes, getting started, Africa is the poorest continent in the world. It's an established fact. We seem to know that and we've come to accept or live with that fact. It's not because we lack the resources that other continents have, the other parts of the world have. No, that's not why we are the poorest continent in the world. It's basically because our people have not acquired the capacity to convert problems to opportunities at scale. Now, I understand that you might talk about the innovation going on in Africa. We have innovators, we have people building systems, building companies, the tech industry is booming. Yes, there are outliers, but if you look at it very well, the number of people who are creating innovation, who are innovative on the continent or in our nation, uh, compared to the population of the continent, is a tiny, tiny fraction. If you look at Africa, every corner you look, if you look at every street in Nigeria, if you live in Lagos, I live in Uyo, anywhere, every street, you see problems. And we say problems are opportunities in disguise. So how come we are unable to convert our problems to opportunities? It's basically because we have a deficiency. And this deficiency is that people have not acquired the capacity to convert problems to opportunities at scale. Few people are doing it, but the majority of people are just consumers. People are not being innovative, are not creating, are not um, taking that opportunity around them. And it's not their fault. It's a problem we have. And like we say, Africa has a thinking problem. When I say thinking problem, our schools and our education systems promote memorization above thinking and creativity. So when someone tells you that he has a first class from an average university, what that person is saying is, I was able to give my lecturers back exactly what they asked me. Whatever they gave me, I memorized it, gave it back to them. When you look at our system of grading exams, an A1, an A2 jam or whatever, is basically who can memorize data or knowledge fast and give it back the way it is. Students are rated based on their ability to pass exams rather than their skills, and our ability to solve problems. Our education system has not promoted problems of in thinking. So somebody is asking too many questions in class, that person becomes a problem to the lecturer and that student is likely going to fail. The more you think, the more we push you aside. The more zombie-like you are, take this information. There are 15 rivers in Africa. These are their names, these are their lengths, these are their locations. Exam time, give us the 15 rivers in Africa, their names and their lengths. Whoever can answer that question, is considered the brightest kid in the class. That is where that is what has kept us where we are as a continent. Our system of education, our system of teaching, that is the problem. And the problem, the truth is that until we become a nation and a continent of people who can think critically through problems and have acquired the skills to create what we think of, we won't achieve our potential. The world is afraid of Africa. We have a massive potential. But you see, problem on one side, we are unable to think about the problems. How do we pick our problems? and convert them to solutions. Now, let me give you a few examples at about what, what I mean that Africa has a thinking problem. Let me take Nigeria as an example. Nigeria is one of the largest oil producing countries on the continent. We produce our crude oil, or rather no, we drill our crude oil 
and we export it to the world, the world thinks on it, processes it, refines it, and sells it back to us. The easy part is what we do. What we just do is dig the pipe into the ground, drill it out, put it on tanker and tankers, send it to wherever it's going to, and then send it back to us. So we like the easy part. We want to do the easy part. What requires the mind, we know they for there. You won't find us there. And it's not a Nigerian problem per se. It's a problem that has to do with many other African countries. And I'm going to give you other examples. If you Google today, the largest cocoa exporting country in the world is Ivory Coast. Cote d'Ivoire exports the largest amount of cocoa in the world. Google today, what are the largest chocolate exporting countries in the world? You won't see Cote d'Ivoire near the top 20. You will see Switzerland, you will see Belgium, you will see Germany. Countries that don't have one cocoa tree are exporting more chocolate and are making more money from chocolate than Cote than d'Ivoire is making from all their cocoa put together. What's the problem? We take what God has given us and sell it to the world. No work done on it. These people take it, do the brain work on it, process it and sell it back to us. I mean, go to, to Chad. You see them harvesting cottons on the farm, loading them in containers and exporting them. And yet we're exporting what? Wool and fabric from around the world. Timber, we export timber to the world in port furniture. Go to Kaduna. One of the largest exports in Kaduna say, today is ginger. People just harvest their ginger and export. Yet, what? I mean, if you look at the, the, the difference between what can be made from ginger oil and ginger, one ton of ginger is probably going to make, if you convert it to oil, it's going to be probably make 10, 20 times more than you get. But the problem is this. We are mentally lazy. We're not willing to think. We just want the easy part. We know what, let's just do this and take it out. And just, people just want the easy part. And until we get to become a nation and a continent that can think, so we have problems. What are the problems our society that is having? And we look at that problem, think about it. And when we think about solutions, we have acquired the skill. So it's two things, thinking and skill. The ability to think and the skill to create what we think about. We are never going to live where we are as a continent. Now, you're wondering who am I? Let me just give an introduction before we go into the main business. My name is David Ogunshola. I'm a software developer and I'm an entrepreneur. I've been in business for about 10 years. But today, I prefer to be called a teacher. So I'm a software engineer who ended up becoming a classroom teacher. That's the my own transition. People are trying to go into tech. Some of us are moving from tech to the classroom. I co-founded a school in 2014 and a code academy in 2018. And I've been teaching children in the classroom for some years now. And because I'm in the education system, I'm able to see firsthand the problems that we have. I'm able to understand the limitations of our curriculum and that the method of teaching and instruction that we use as a nation and as a system is not designed for the future. The more I see problems in society and the more I see school system, the school that is supposedly preparing students to go and challenge the problems of the future, the more I know that our future is in trouble because the schools are not preparing these kids to tackle the challenges that we are going to face. Now, why am I giving you all of these things? This is the real problem. As the world races towards a digital and globalized economy, Nigeria and African schools are not preparing students with the skills required for relevance in the industrial revolution. We're not getting students ready. And this explains why we have problems like unemployment, 33% unemployment, 52% youth unemployment, underemployment. People are, pay, are employed in jobs that can't pay their bills. On productivity, we have three refineries in the nation. None of them is working. These, these are problems we have that we think we have. But like I like to say it, these are not problems. These are symptoms of the real problem. See, no government will ever cure unemployment. If you keep trying to cure unemployment by creating jobs, that problem is never going to end. You don't cure malaria by treating headache. Headache and fever are only symptoms of malaria. If you want to cure the headache and symptom that and fever that comes from malaria, attack the real disease. As long as you keep taking Panadol, headache will go temporarily and come back, go and come back. And that's what we're doing. Create 1 million jobs today. Those jobs will finish and the number of unemployed people in the country will still remain there. The real problem is an educational problem. When we are able to fix it from the educational system, these symptoms disappear. Governments don't create jobs. It's human beings, it's normal citizens that create jobs. Teach them the way that they can go out there and pick problems and convert them to employment. And let's do that at scale. Unemployment will disappear from our system. That's just the, the reality. And so while these challenges are going on, a few skills have been identified as critical, required, if people are going to be relevant in the future. Seven skills have been identified. They're called the global achievement gaps. That these skills are what people will need. Students don't need A1 in maths and physics to succeed in today's world. What they need 
critical thinking and problem solving. How do they solve problems? How do they convert? I mean, there's a flood on my street. How do we ensure that our street stops flooding? Those are problems that somebody has to think through. Plastic waste has been disposed everywhere. How do we think about problems and solve them? Two, collaboration across networks. How do I work with people and achieve results? Sadly, the world is needing collaboration. Today, schools are, school is teaching isolation. In the classroom, we say, don't talk to anybody, write your exam, you know, don't ask anybody questions. Whereas in the real world, nobody works alone. So what the world needs is opposite from what our schools are teaching. But we understand, that's why I say that the school is a problem. Three, students are going to need agility and adaptability, initiative and entrepreneurship, ability to create jobs. The truth is nobody is creating any jobs for anybody. Nobody has a job waiting for any student out there. People will need to be able to leave school and go out there and create jobs, effective oral and written communication. Whatever skills you have, you will need to be able to communicate, make a pitch, make an, a presentation, and sell your vision to the world. Accessing and analyzing information, especially in a day where everything is available on Google and there's so much fake news out there. And once you Google something, you see millions of data and, 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 and information. How are people able to assess this information, analyze them, and know what they need? And number seven, curiosity and imagination. People that are able to ask questions. Schools need to stop to teach, to stop encouraging students from answering questions, but teach them to start asking questions. Why is this thing like this? So you say, you say this is yellow. Why is it yellow? What makes it yellow? Where did yellow come from? Be it curiosity and imagination, being able to ask questions. Those are the skills that our students need to succeed in today's world. Sadly, these skills are not taught in a classroom. You can't teach, there's no, there's no subject called critical thinking and problem solving in any school. What you can do is that you can introduce activities and programs that encourage these skills, that encourage the development of these skills, activities that help students to think critically. So schools are now integrating things like chess into the classroom because chess makes you think. So it's not a subject, but I mean, those are, so we're talking about how do we develop these skills in our students? And friends, this is actually where coding comes in. So all I've been saying is why we're trying to even bring in coding. Coding bridges the gap because it teaches a new way of thinking and activates the mind of children to a new way of seeing the world. If you had joined at the beginning where we played the video, one of the opening quotes is everybody should learn how to code because coding teaches you how to think. That's Steve Jobs. That's why we bring in coding. Coding is actually, we're not trying to just add a new subject to the classroom and say, you know what, let's, 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 we don't have enough, there are no subjects already. We are not trying to add more. But we're bringing in programming because we, there's something we want to get our students be, to be able to do. And so it's not about coding for coding's sake. It's about how do we inspire innovation in our students? How do we get them thinking? How do we get them creative and innovative? And so that's why we do what we're doing. And so you are here and you are thinking, okay, so me, I want to teach coding. Maybe you are a school owner and you're thinking, I want to integrate coding to my, to my school. Or you are a teacher saying, I want to start, I want to learn how to teach kids to code. Or maybe you are just saying, me, I want to even learn how to code. Or you are a parent, you have children who you want to expose to learn how to code. Where do you get started? There are two things that are critical for success. If you want to have coding integrated into school or to your home or to your children's or whatever, two things are necessary, the teacher and the platforms. The teacher, who is going to teach the students? If you are the proposed teacher, then you need to ask yourself some questions about your preparedness and knowledge. Am I qualified? Am I ready? Am I prepared? If you are a school owner, you are asking yourself, do I have the person who can actually guide my students in this area? If you're a parent, you're asking yourself, do I have access to a teacher or do I want to become the teacher? So I'm going to talk to you about basically what you need to be a teacher. So those of you who are teachers or you are school owners and you're thinking, is my teacher qualified? You want to ensure that they meet certain requirements. And the next thing is the platform. You cannot use the same platform and tools for all your students. Now students are learning from the age of five, six. My, my first daughter is eight. She's already learning to code in Python. The boy is six. He's, I mean, the, the platform that she at eight uses and what the boy at six uses are not the same. Of course, everybody starts from where they, they can. I mean, we have five-year-olds who are in our classroom learning to code. So it's important that you know the different tools that work for different levels of students so that you're able to know what do I apply at each stage? What do I introduce my students to? And what do I use at each stage of my class? So I'm going to talk about these two things critically. The ideal teacher, who is going to make a fantastic coding teacher? There are basic requirements. Number one, somebody who knows the basics of computer programming and computer science. The truth is you can't teach what you don't know. You can't give what you don't have. So if you're thinking of teaching coding, now you don't have to have studied computer science. I did computer science and many of the guys on our team did computer science. But we've realized that it is not a requirement. 
people who didn't even study computer science teach coding effectively. And we have them. We have people on our team who came in without that knowledge. But all they did is they were willing to learn the core foundations, which is why number two is there. You must be a curious and explorative learner, somebody who is willing to go after knowledge. As of today, I don't have what it takes, but I, can I move myself from zero to where I would acquire the necessary skills needed to teach my students to code? That's the next question you need to ask yourself. Well, those are the requirements. So one, you know the basics, you're curious and explorative. Three, you understand the rudiments of teaching children because teaching adults and teaching children are not the same. You can teach adults as a lecturer. I mean, the way I'm, I'm, I'm practically giving a lecture now, I'm just vibing and ranting and talking, and you're understanding what I'm saying to, the, to, to a large extent. I can't teach children like this. Children need drama, activity. You will have to ensure that you have their attention. The attention span is very short. So you don't come here and be speaking big, big English. You have to find them. So it's somebody who understands children. You need to be able to know when you've lost them, know when they are distracted, know what illustration to use to get the point to, to their mind for them to understand. And it's resourceful, able to adapt to different situations. So you're trying to use an illustration about a phone application and they don't get it. You need to be able to find out, okay, what else can I use? So you want to teach them about programs. Uh, elevator. You know elevator? And they say, no. Maybe you prepared your lesson plan to explain how elevator is controlled by a computer program. And your students have never entered the elevator before. On the spot, you need to say, oh, what else can I use? Okay, traffic light. You know a traffic light? Red, yellow, green. That's the program. Nobody controls it, but the red changes to yellow by itself, to green by itself. It's program. You must be able to adapt to, to transfer your points so that they understand. So when it's not working, you know what to do. That's the basic. If you know the basics of computer science or are willing to learn it, by the way, we have built an online course. It's going to go live on the 1st of November. I think that's Monday next week, right? So on the 1st of November, that online course is going live. It's a course that teaches teachers to teach coding. What I'm doing is an introduction, but that course is an online course. You can take it, write an exam, get a certification. At the end of that course, what we talk about, the basics and core foundations here, we explain every each of them in detail in that online course. And then a few other things again, how to talk, how to prepare your classroom, what to do, how to know when you're that course actually is an introduction, much more than what I can do here today. But number one, if you are thinking of being the teacher, this is who you need to be and what you need to be able to do. The next thing is the platform. There are different platforms that students can use to learn to code, depending on their age and the resources available, whether they have access to the internet or not. Are you teaching the classroom? Does the classroom have internet access? That determines what platform you can use. Are you teaching at home? You have just a child, they have, they have a laptop or a tablet. All of those things determine what platform or tool you can use. And then how advanced are they? The person who is starting to learn has a different platform, but it gets to a point where they are grow that platform and they need something more challenging. You need to be able to know the different tools to change them to, to move them to, so that they are able to you keep them challenged, keep them learning. And so I'm just gonna talk about those platforms in a bit. First platform is this, this is important now. If you have total beginners, they have zero prior knowledge, they don't know anything about coding, five years, six years, seven years, whatever age, but this is the first time they are learning to code. There's a platform online called code.org. You may need to, you may want to take that down. You may know the platform already, but I'm going to just explain it briefly. And if time allows me, I could do a brief illustration to just show you what it looks like on the screen. So this is perfect for total beginners, especially for parents. So you are a parent, you have kids. I recommend that you use code.org because you don't have a curriculum. You don't have what it, you don't probably don't have the time. Now, this is what it does. Code.org starts them from a very basic level and advances in difficulty. So you have course A, course B, C, D, E, and F, and it advances teaching new skills, new complexities as they progress. It has videos embedded in it. So you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to know the concept. For example, they want to learn a concept called loops or conditionals. You yourself, you don't know what is loops or conditionals. There's a video in code.org that explains what loops are, what conditionals are. It's free to use. There is no cost attached to it. The guys who built it, built it is sponsored by Microsoft and Amazon, and those companies are actually paying for the building of Code.org. If you watch the video we started with, that video was sponsored by Code.org. However, if you want to add your student to a coach's class, for example, we have a classroom that we add students to that allows us to see what they do. So they're in their different homes around the world. 
working on the platform, where we can see their code. When they have difficulty, they can say, oh, teacher, I have a difficulty on course C level 12. And we can go in there, see what they've done, and then we can help them work on that. The only downside is that it requires internet access. It does not work online. It works on the internet. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just quickly pause my, my screen share. I'm going to come back to this screen in a bit now. And I, I want to give you a brief simulation of how code.org works. So I'm going to share another screen that explains. Okay, good. So let me add sound to this now. So this is code.org. This is course A. So um, when you start this course, what you're going to see is an explainer video that explains what is going to do, what, what they need to do. So they click on the video, they watch the video, there's an explainer. Then when they go to the next stage, it actually starts, they start solving problems. So you have a problem. This is the Angry Birds. Most of you have watched Angry Birds cartoons. You may not have watched it, but your children have watched it. So this is the red bird. The bird wants to eat the pig. So what do you do? You simply program, you simply program, um, use the arrows. So this bird needs to go left, left, left. So use this to go left, left, and left. And when you run, it moves. Now, this child feels like he's playing a game, but what he's already doing, this child is already learning programming. Programming, no past this one. He's just being able to give instruction to a computer to take step after step. Now, how does it go? You count how many steps. Each arrow moves the bird one step. So one, two, three. But this time, we're going down, down, down. And whatever you do, it's going to do exactly what they ask you to do. So if you write the wrong code, for example, now you need to go down, 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 and left. If you say down, 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 and right, see what's going to happen. You're going to go down, 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 and attempt to go right. The child needs to come, find out what is missing, and put the right code, and then we do it. And it goes step by step. The curriculum is already created. You already have the platform. You already have the tools. You already have the videos in 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 the in the pro in the platform. So what you just do is give them access to it. Now, if you are a parent and you're thinking, okay, but I don't have um this platform, you want a coach to coach your child. That's where this comes in. For example, this is our classroom. So they come. What they do is they come to the sign in. They enter. A, we give you a class code. Every child is going to see their name. They click their name, enter their password. And what happens here is that the system tracks their progress. And we or our teachers, our coaches, can see what they are doing and can actually monitor them. As a teacher, you can create a classroom, sign up as a teacher, add your students, give them the access. They see what you, they, they go on the platform, do what they need to do. You see what they are doing, and you're able to come back and monitor them and track their own progress. So let me go back now to our presentation. Um, so that's code.org for total beginners, people who are new to, to programming, they don't know anything, they're just starting, and it goes, they have curriculum design from ages five to up to 12, or even up to high school. It's a fantastic platform you can use. Now the next platform is mid-level learners who need to develop or be able to express their own creativity. Now they've used code.org, they have understood how to think in, in steps, in processes. The next platform is Scratch. You probably have heard of Scratch. Scratch gives learners a platform to express their creativity. Unlike code.org, code.org just gives you problems to solve that helps you think and develop your own imagination. But here, in Scratch, the student is able to go on a neutral platform, think of anything they can imagine, and create it. It's powerful enough to handle even very robust programming. So students can build amazing stuff. You've, um, I've seen somebody build Super Mario with Scratch. The Super Mario we played as children, that was Nintendo. People have created that game in Scratch using block programming. So in Scratch, what's unique about Scratch? The codes are in form of blocks, just like you saw on code.org. But in this case, the student is able to mix the code to create something they want to do. The upside is that it's free to download. Just go to the website, scratch.mit.edu. Download it to your system. It can work offline. You don't need to be on the internet. So while code.org has a downside of your child has to be online with Scratch, your child does not need to be online. They can work offline. However, if you're using Scratch and you don't have a curriculum or a teaching guide, 
the child will be confused on the first day. You just give them a platform. They don't know what to do. Which button do I click? What do I push? What do I touch? They are thinking. They are confused. So you will need a curriculum to be able to use Scratch. For those who might be new to this, let me show you what Scratch looks like. So you've never used Scratch before. Let me just open it and share my screen. And um, hope I can get that, okay? Okay, good. So here is Scratch on my screen. So this is Scratch. Um, you have sprites here. You can actually change your sprite. The sprite is the object you are programming. So I want to program a, a cat or a boy. So this is a boy or this is a beetle. Now it's the beetle I want to program. So that's my sprite. These are my codes. Um, your codes are arranged in the categories for motion. Motion has to do with movement. Um, so I say, okay, when the green flag is clicked, um, move 10 steps. This is the green flag up here. So whenever I click the green flag, this beetle moves 10 steps. I can say, okay, when the green flag is clicked, turn right 15 degrees. Each time I click this, my beetle turn right 15 degrees. I can say, you know what? Let it turn 15 degrees 10 times. So I can put blocks of code inside blocks of code. And when I do this, it actually does what I asked it to do. I can say, you know what? Once I do this, just keep moving forward nonstop. Keep moving forward. It's going to keep moving forward. But now it has gone to the end. I can say, okay, you know what? I want to add. So the blocks of code, you have blocks for looks. If you want to do like animation or stuff like that, you can actually um, get your, your sprite to say things. So it says, hello. Uh, okay, where is this sprite? The sprite has disappeared. Let's add, let's bring another sprite. Um, so this is this girl now. I want her to say, say hello for two seconds. So once you click on it, it says hello. You can add it, say something else. My name is, um, my name is, okay. Vale. Rina. So when you click on this, okay, when you run this, it says hello for two seconds. And then she goes to the next thing. My name is Valerina. Scratch is super, super powerful. It goes very advanced. It can do very complex things, create variables, create functions. You have conditionals, if, else, blocks. You can have if. Everything you can write in any language, you can create in Scratch. It has an extension where you can even bring in music. You can create music and have your own piano playing. So if you're a music person, you can say, okay, you know what? Play a note. Um, you can bring in your piano. And so you can actually create music with Scratch. You can do robotics, make it, make it micro beats. You can connect robotics to Scratch and program your robots. A lot of things you can connect to text to speech, do voice to text to voice, a lot of things. This one, people usually think that Scratch is for children. And oh, children, I want the adult with grade one. They are grow Scratch. I tell them the reason why you think Scratch is about growing is because you don't have a curriculum. If you have a robust curriculum, Scratch is very, very robust and very engaging. And it can actually keep students engaged for years. They will keep learning and learning and learning with Scratch. But like I said, it requires a curriculum and a teaching guide. Before the end of this webinar, I'm going to talk about the curriculum that we developed for teaching programming and teaching with Scratch. The third platform and the last I'm going to talk about today is for advanced learners. So your child started from code.org when he was five. They got to seven and they finished code.org or eight and they went to Scratch. Now they are done with Scratch. You want to move them to something more advanced like Python, JavaScript, C++, you know, teach them game development, teach them to write code now. All along now, they've been dragging code in form of blocks, which has shifted their thinking. Meanwhile, programming, like we see, is actually more about the way of thinking than it's about writing code. But here you are now, you want to take them to learn Python or something more advanced. We have this platform called Code Combat. It's an amazing platform. In the, on this platform, they are not dragging blocks of code. They're actually writing their code in text. And it's a gamified learning environment. So this is what it does. The child feels like they are playing a game. Just the way you play a game with game pad and pin pad. But in this case, they want to move a player from here to go fight an enemy here and open this door and do this. They need to move their player. But instead of using buttons and game pad, they are writing code to move the player. So to move the player forward, they write Python code to go forward. To move the player up, write Python code to go up. So as they are trying to solve puzzles, they are actually learning real-world programming. By the end of the day, you are amazed. By the time they go to a real ID to start programming, you'll be shocked what the student can do because they've actually learned those platforms. Same thing like code.org. 
you need to create a classroom where your students, you assign them work to do, they work, you see their code. I have students who are in boarding school, they are in different parts of the world, but they are on a classroom on Code Combat and Osaria. And when they get stuck, they just send an email, say, ah, I'm stuck on chapter three, course 12. And I go in there, you see the code they are writing, you see where the bug is, and then you're able to help them figure it out and return the code for them, and then they continue. Two downsides, or three, two downsides, yeah. One, works online, it does not work offline. And number two, it is not free. Code.org was free. Scratch is free. Python and Rosaria is not free. You have to buy a license for every child in dollars. So, but it's an amazing platform. So what I'm going to try, attempt to do is see if I can, if I have a, I think I have a page. I have, I have a, 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 a code combat page just to show you what the platform looks like. And um, I hope that's able to, okay, good seeing that now so let me just share my screen and show you what that looks like um good okay so here you are this is what code combat looks like now this is the game environment this is the player where you can see my mouse the player needs to go right down and right to get this gem but how do you move the player to get the gem so you start the level and it actually guides you, tells you type move down command on line six. It actually, so there's actually a coaching in the platform. So hero dot move down and then hero dot move right. So that's Python code I'm writing there. When I run my code, this player goes like this and does exactly what I asked him to do. And that level is completed. Next, it goes to the next level. I say done. The student goes, it loads the next level and a different problem. This time, more likely, most likely more complex than the other one. And as they keep going on, it keeps introducing new concepts to them. Now I need to go here, pick this gem, pick this gem, come back, pick this gem. Now just all the student needs to do is write his code. In this case, it's not blocks. You are writing your code. You have the code bank here so they can see what code they need to write to use. When there are new codes to write, they can actually bring in new levels, new codes, new words, while loops, if conditions, whatever. It's our students who use this platform. By the time they are done with the basic levels on this platform, and then they go on a proper coding ID, maybe we'll give them now Python, go and start coding in Python. Even we as their teachers, we are shocked at the things that they are able to do with these platforms. So let me go back to the slide. I'm beginning to wrap up this presentation now, and then I'm going to take questions. Well, if you have any question, you can actually drop the question on the chat box if you do, but if you don't have any. So that's basically Python. So we talked about three platforms, code.org, free, Scratch, free to download, code combat, and ozaria.com, licensed. If you have a student who needs a license, you can actually reach out to us. We can add them to a classroom where we have, we have we purchase licenses from the organization. I think a license is $10 a month per student, but the value is significantly amazing. You will enjoy the platform. So you are a school and you are thinking, but this thing, you all want to scratch, we don't have a curriculum. How do we explain these concepts to them? The concepts of computer science, where do they start from? That's actually where we were ourselves as, as a team some years back, we were in the same problem. And what we decided to do is we looked for programs, we looked for books everywhere around the continent. Trust me, we traveled, went to Kenya, and everybody that we know is teaching coding on the continent. What books are they people using? There were no books. And so we decided three years ago to start creating our own books. And over the last three years, three to four years, we want to create the first set of textbooks for children in Africa to learn to code. There is no coding textbook anywhere in Africa. I don't know of any, nobody has seen any. These books, as soon as we launched them a few months ago, Others began to come in from Kenya, from Ghana, that finally there's a book for children. But I'm just going to introduce the books briefly. It's designed to help students to learn computer programming at a very young age. The books are designed to inspire creativity, promote critical thinking, and equip children with the skills to create whatever they can imagine. Remember, that's where we started from, Africa's problem. Until we get at scale, people who can think about problems and they have the skill to create what they think about. That's what we're trying to, that's the gap we're actually trying to fill. So people see a problem. How do we solve this problem? What if we build an app or we do something? And it, the application goes beyond coding. Computational thinking can be used in any area of life, but that's what we're trying to achieve. And so what is in the book? Just in two minutes, I'm going to show you. The book has explains the core concepts of computer programming. 
So things like algorithms, what are bugs, what are, what are patterns, what are sequences, what are events. By the way, these are the books. I actually have them, I have copies here. So um, you can buy, you can, I'll talk about how you can get them at the end of, 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 of the webinar. But it explains the core computer science concepts gives them activities to challenge their thinking so you have puzzles in the book you have activities that they can do things they can try things they can so when they learn a concept before even going on the computer they can actually even without the students without computers can actually start practicing what they learn and then it takes them to core programming hands-on programming in scratch where they can build games there are games there are animations they will build we actually have games as they follow the book they end up building their first like this is in book two they build a foot catcher game they build an animation a cartoon that they're going to make a storyline of two birds conversing and going to learn how to fly and all of that they are actually going to create things on their own and the last thing it teaches them is digital citizenship i think i didn't include that here digital citizenship is this part of the world that nobody is talking about. Our children are going online. They are learning online. They are taking courses online. The world is going digital. But who is teaching our children how to survive online? Who is teaching them about the dangers of the internet? About the about how to survive in a technology in, a, in an internet driven world. For example, a child is signing up to a platform and you tell him create a password. Does the child even know what a password is? Who has taught him what a password is? How do they know about internet privacy? scammers and, and all of those things online. How do they see emails? Email is a scam. This email is a phishing attack. How do they know what not to share? Before they go online and give you, they, they tell them, give me your mother's credit card and the child enters the credit card. Digital citizenship teaches them how to survive online. We have that integrated into the book and it can be used both in primary schools and secondary schools. Simple enough for five-year-olds to understand and challenging enough for even high schoolers to understand. We recommend that level one, two, three, actually every child should begin with level one, two, Three, which are the levels we are promoting for now. Level one to four actually talk about one to three teaches Scratch, level four teaches game development, and level five teaches Python programming. Fantastic books that you will enjoy. And we have tremendous success stories. This key, these books makes classrooms come alive in different schools that are using it. Students, parents can buy it, schools can buy it. Schools have integrated it to their curriculum as their textbook. So we can have teachers go there teach using the textbook in different schools and the results are amazing. So this is just um, the basics of getting you started. At least now, if you want to have, you want to start teaching a child to code, you know what to do, you know what tools to use, you know what possible challenges you could have. If you are trying to reach us and my team will be happy to partner with you, you run the school, you run to work with your school. Um, we have an office in New York and we can reach the Lagos. The addresses are on the screen where you are there. If you want to get copies of the book, we can order them online, earlycodingbook.com. We can ship them to you anywhere in Nigeria. And that's basically what we wanted to share with you today. We hope that your questions have been answered. But if you have questions that have not been answered, you can take the email, the phone number, the website, or any of the addresses there. And I'm going to end the screen share now. And I have just a few minutes to go. And um, yeah, I didn't want this to go beyond an hour and we're still within an hour, but we're just gonna throw it open now. You have questions you wanna ask or comments you wanna pass, please go ahead. Um, just lift your hand or use the unmute button and just go ahead and speak. Okay, so we have somebody's hand, Florence Austin Akeke. Please go ahead. Hello, sir, can you hear me? I can hear you very well, good evening. Good evening, Mr. David. Um, permit me to use this opportunity to say a very big thank you. Thank you so much for the, the this platform and for even making it an open one. You, you didn't request for any payments at all. I say, may God bless you. May God richly, richly bless you. Yeah, I'm, I'm organizing um, from 1st of November, I'll be going into schools here in Calabar to start up coding clubs. And just this evening I was on Facebook and I saw the link, I had to register and thank God I was admitted, it has not been closed. I really want to say thank you. Then I would like to ask, please, do you have, um, would there be a recorded part of, the, of this session? Because I didn't join on time. So I would like to really get all that you discussed earlier before I joined. All right. So yes, um, thank you for joining, and 
Thank you for your kind words and comments. Yes, this session was recorded and it's also live on YouTube. So you can actually go to our, to the YouTube, maybe at the end of the, the session, okay. uh, we're going to email the YouTube link to everybody. You can go and you can actually watch everything that has from the beginning. I think the only thing that we didn't stream to YouTube was the video we played at the beginning. We played a five minute video to get started. And okay. so because we don't own the video, we didn't stream that, but it's recorded. On the recorded version, you can get that. We can send you that link. So yes, um, going to schools in Calabar, remember, I, I think you need, you need the beginning part. We, we talked about why we're doing what we're doing. It's more than, it's yeah. not because we just want to teach coding. There's something we're trying to get. There's something we're trying to, to do. There's a thinking we want to introduce to Nigeria and to Africa. So the more schools you can reach, the more you're going to help solve the problems waiting for us in the future. So yes, please go ahead and get that going. In any way, you need our team. We have a team in Uyo. We will be happy to connect with you. The schools you need, you are going to speak to, they need copies of the books. The books are available. By the way, the books are available. They cost 3,005 each. But if you're buying in bulk for schools, there is a discount for schools. Level one, level two, and level three are available now. Four and five will be available in December. Level four teaches game development. Level five teaches Python. But level one, two, three, takes a child from zero knowledge, a child who has never coded before. In fact, the first mm. topic in book one talks about welcome to the world of computers. We are assuming that they've never even seen computers before. We introduce them to computers, then what programs are, and then it goes on and on. So fantastic resources that it took us three years to develop these resources. And we are confident about the results. Wow. You can generate them anywhere you find, anywhere they are used. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I really, right. really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. I've You're already done LinkedIn. I've connected. I've asked for a connection on LinkedIn. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Great. Great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Those hey, how are you, sir? Hey, Mr. Ni, nee, how are you doing? Good to see you, Mr. Posh. Oh, this is late now. I'm just joining just five minutes to the end of this event. I didn't know now. Please send us DM later on so that our own children can join us. It's only Calabar people that you ought to be blessing. Bless <laughs> children that are in Lagos too now. <laughs> All right, no problem. I'm going to send you the link. I'm going to send I mean, you. Where can I get the book to buy the book? Uh, the books are available in Lagos. I can. They're actually online. You can order online. But I mean, I can. I can via. I can send you a VIP copy. I'll just charge you like three times the price. I'll send you a VIP copy. Oh, no problem. Man. Let's support the ministry now. Charge me <laughs> ten times the price. <laughs> right, no, Allah. So I'll chat to you after the after the meeting about the books. How to okay, get okay, thank you, sir. And I'll be in Lagos this this week anyway, so um we can connect and I can I can I can. Okay, please bring the books. Level one to three, when you are coming, sir. No trouble at all. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mister Dave. Good evening. I tell you, fifteen. Can we know your name, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is Mister Bimo Godwin. Oh, okay. Yes, um, I must say I really appreciate um, the classes. It has been very um, educative and informative as well. Um, from what I've be, been able to deduce, um, the excellence of the coding stuff is more or less a way of um, giving people the ability to think critically. And you know, um, people, these uh, children of, uh, of nowadays, they have other kind of games, other kind of things to which they do that also tries to buttress their thinking capacity, like the chess games, like the Ludo games, like uh, draft games, okay? So apart from using coding uh, to create applications that are maybe game-based, like you said earlier in the creation of Super Mario's and the rest, what other thing does coding tend to address? What other challenges does coding you know, tend to address apart from maybe creating of game-based applications and the rest? Uh, okay, if you had joined in the beginning and watched the video that we played, you probably will have seen that. I mean, everything we are doing today, that we are able to have this meeting and you are sitting in your house and I'm in my house is because somebody wrote some code somewhere. That you are able to go on Facebook and connect and see pictures and you can join, you can see what we are doing is basically because someone wrote a code somewhere. And almost every problem that you're able to transfer money to somebody without going to the bank is because somebody learned how to code. The challenge is this. Like we said, the problems are endless. New problems are waiting for us. And we can't keep depending on everybody outside or outside to solve the problems and import to us. That's why I started by saying that is why Africa is poor, because we have a thinking problem. We as African, our kids just, we believe in just consuming. People have done the hard work. We just take the easy path and we work with the easy path. We're trying to get them to become innovators, to become 
to be able to see problems and respond to those problems. So beyond even just coding, not everybody is going to be a programmer eventually. I mean, if you watch the video, it says whatever you want to, whether you want to be a rock star, a doctor. Today, we have robots doing surgeries. The robots that do surgeries are not going to be programmed by me because I don't know medicine. I can't do the surgery. It's a doctor who understands how to program a robot that can actually program a robot to do the surgery that he will have done physically. You understand? So it's actually applicable in every industry. It's when you learn how to code and you go into any industry, it gives you a new set of lenses. You're able to see your industry differently. You're able to see problems differently. The eye with which you look at problems changes. Like we said, computational thinking is applicable in every area of life. How do you bake? How do you, how do you solve a problem? How do you fix something that is bad? Breaking problems down into small problems, into small bits, and taking them step by step is the thinking we're trying to introduce. So application is across board. And like we say, tech is not an industry. Tech only attaches itself to an industry. When you take tech and connect to finance, you have fintech. You take tech and connect to education, you have edtech. You take tech and connect to agriculture, you have agritech, health tech. Tech just, it gives, it enhances every other industry that exists before now, transportation. So whenever there's problem, tech comes in there to bring solutions and give people a different set of lenses to look at it from. That's my response to your question, sir. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so Mr. Friday. Okay, good evening, sir. Yeah, okay. I have two, two questions. My first question is um, based on the first slide you shared, the poorest nation in the world and it would be nearly impossible knowing that most of african students don't have access to computer um but most of them might also have access to to smartphone can this um coding um, um, um curriculum you've set up be used on phone for, for example on android phone for which some of these students might have access to but they don't have access to computer that's number one question okay. and then the second question is I am based here in the, in the city of Patakot, and I, if I want to take up the the coding or what you are doing as a business here, for me, not like I want to teach, but I want to market what you are doing and then make it a business. Do you have a, a marketing tools for me to use and visit schools and then um, maximize the profit from there? Okay, good, good. Okay, so two questions. I'm going to start with the first one. Um, Yes, we understand that Africa is disadvantaged because of internet penetration, access to computers, access to electricity. Most of the platforms that, in fact, you've seen all the platforms I talked about, Code.org, Ozaria, Code Combat, they all are online, they use the internet. There are even more platforms, way more platforms than I've talked about. Tinker, I mean, so many of them. We realize that one of the reasons why this hasn't gone far is because of the limitations we have. That is one of the things that inspired us to take these things offline. You use Scratch. Scratch, we chose Scratch because Scratch does not require internet. So we actually designed with a problem in view. We realized that we have that problem of connectivity and access to internet. But yes, I talked about three platforms, Code.org, Scratch, and Code Combat. And I talked about them being from the beginner, intermediary, and pro. Code.org can be used on phone to a point where they can no longer use on phone. For example, Scratch will work on tablets and it's going to work on the latest versions of Android. Older versions of Android won't use Scratch. However, the more advanced platforms for coding with Python and JavaScript, you cannot use phone. Sorry, you will have to use a computer for now. Um, you can use phone to learn, but you can't use phone for production-based um, programming. So that answers the question. You can start with phones, but at some point, you will have to migrate to a computer. And we try to respond to that challenge of online access. And that's why we created what we created. Number two, you want to turn this into a business. You want to market this. Of course, for example, I talked about the books. The books sell for a fee, 3,500 a copy. But if you want to resell for us, we have a reseller price. So resellers can actually buy from us and sell to people, to schools and individuals and actually make profit. We have that. So I can actually send you that. If anybody's interested in that, you market the books. Actually, just to be upfront here, for resellers, from the price you sell it three five, we give you a commission of 700 Naira per book. So for every book you sell for us, you actually earn 700 Naira as a reseller, just so you know. 
So yes, and then not just that too, if you get, we have virtual classes that run online. We have students that join our classes from different places. You have families that are looking for a coding teacher who can, who are willing to join virtual classes. They can join us and then, yep, we can discuss something um, if you want to do business. We are, but yeah, for the books, yes, there's a plan. We plan to get these books nationwide and we're working with different distributors and resellers to help us with the books. I think that's what we have defined for now. But whatever else you want to talk about, we can discuss that privately later. Or you can send us an email. We'll be happy to talk about that. All right, thank Friday, you, did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Well appreciated. Yeah. All right, great. Great. So do we have any further questions before we try to pull over the curtain for this? Any question, anything? You have a child, you have school, you have students. Okay, Fola, your hands are up. So yeah, you can meet and ask your question, please. Well, yes, good evening. evening. And um, thank you very much for today. I would just like to add one or two things to what you have said. Um, okay. the, the person that asked the question about laptops and um, that Well, I think you're breaking. Is it, is it me? Can you hear her clearly? Is it me? Oh, she's breaking. She's breaking. Yeah, for lapis, can you come again? You were breaking. We didn't get you. Can you hear me? Okay, try again. We just heard the last thing you said. Okay, can you hear me now then? Is it better yes. now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay. I said it's good to encourage students to have their own personal laptops. You know, there are so many things children, students, and adults can learn. So many things um, personal computers do and cannot do. The network is breaking, but I think we got your point. I think your point was that students should be encouraged to get personal laptops. If I got you right. Yes, um, which I think, yeah, that's, that's, that's more like what I actually try to explain to him. We encourage, it's best if students have their laptops. They will learn better. They will be able to do much more things with their laptops than just with phones. And um, the phones are limited. Even the tablets are limited. Uh, there's a lot you can't, nobody uses, no company uses tablets in production mode. Nobody, no programmers use tablets for work. It's, um, it's phones that is laptops that they use. All right. Um, any other questions where... This is, we've spent 70 minutes. We wanted to spend maximum of 75. Do we have any other questions? Or do we just pull the curtain here? So for those who joined late, not to worry, we're going to email you the link. You can rewatch them. And um, well, for everybody who came and those who stayed, who joined from the beginning and those who stayed, thank you very much. Um, you have our email, you have our phone numbers, you can reach out to us. You have further questions, you have any ways you would like us to connect with your partner with you, please feel free to reach out to us at any point in time. That being said, I think that is gonna bring us to the end of this webinar. So I am going to...